Let's get started. Uh, welcome to today's monthly seminar. I see a lot of new faces, probably uh, you know, advice are to anyway. Yeah. Uh, today's speaker is uh, uh, Alan Chen from UC Davis. We're going to talk about the appropriate actions. Very interesting. Uh, just a, a quick note here. The video recordings for the previous seminars in this quarter have been uploaded to YouTube. So if you want it on the link, you can send it. We have two more presentations this quarter. It will be on the 23rd and And a quick introduction. Professor Anderson is an assistant professor in the Civil and Environmental Engineering Department at UC Davis. I heard that you are promoting person. Yeah. <laughs> Fingers crossed. Uh, he is an active researcher with the Institute of Education, both in the EV Center and the Energy Center. He graduated from CMU uh, with a PhD in Engineering Public Policy, and his research is primarily focused on the intersection of energy and transportation, with a special <laughs> emphasis on EVs and integration of the energy grid. Without further delay, I will let. Uh, James Davis House and then his presentation. Uh, all right. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks for having me. Yeah, so uh, I understand that you guys have heard a lot about electric vehicles uh, the last couple of weeks. So hopefully you'll bear with one more talk about this, but hopefully a little bit different. Um, yeah, a little bit about me. Um, yeah, thanks for the, the introduction. So I am currently at UC Davis. I joined uh, about a decade ago after graduating from Carnegie Mellon. Actually, my advisor uh, then was uh, Anesh Azevedo, who's now a professor here. I'm sure some of you guys uh, know her. Um, within the University of California, Davis, uh, there is this large... Uh, Institute called ITS, the Institute of Transportation Studies. They are probably one of the largest sustainable transportation uh, institutes in, in the country. Uh, it's been around for 30 or so years uh, at this point. Um, and it houses a bunch of different research centers, including the one that I mainly sit in, which is the Electric Vehicle Research Center. Uh, that one's been around even since long before EVs were on the market, which I also found kind of interesting. I don't know what folks were working on back then, but um, yeah, it's a very exciting time to be uh, in the electric vehicle space these days. Uh, and I want to talk a little bit about kind of my motivation for being at Davis. It it's going to tie in a lot with um, the work that I'm doing and, and kind of the propagation of, of that work. Uh, so Davis is situated uh, pretty close by to Sacramento um, with ITS. And one of the really nice things is our proximity to policy. Uh, and so we are close to the California legislature and a bunch of the regulatory agencies. So like the California Energy Commission, uh, Department of Transportation or Caltrans and the California Air Resources Board. Um, so a lot of the talk that I'm gonna be um, providing today uh, is going to be well connected with trying to ensure that the research that we do uh, kind of passes on into the real world, besides just kind of publishing papers. And, and we do that by connecting with policymakers. Uh, okay. And actually, before I begin this part, uh, I should just mention that if anyone has any questions, feel free to raise your hand, speak up, interrupt me. I'm very comfortable with, uh, yeah not just talking to you guys, but having a conversation. Um, so my kind of motivation in working in this area is really kind of about climate change. Um, that has been essentially what drawn has drawn me to thinking about energy systems uh, and mitigating climate change, right, requires a huge effort in a technology transition, in behavioral change. Uh, and so 
yeah, it's a rich area to do research and there's a lot of questions that kind of remain unanswered. So to meet a lot of the climate change targets, right? So California is a particular leader in this area. Uh, we, we were passing climate change legislation and regulation for several dec decades now. Um, back in the sort of mid 2000s, there was the first like really big policy um, that basically said California needs to reduce all of their emissions uh, down to 80% uh, below 1990 levels by 2050. Okay, so that's like a serious amount of emissions reduction. Uh, the chart on the right is California. This one is the federal, just to give some perspective. But importantly, right, if you think about what that means, if I were to totally uh, clean up all the transportation emissions, right, you still wouldn't get there, right? So really this means that if this is kind of an all and above uh, approach strategy, uh, so all of the sectors here essentially need to decarbonize in order for us to be able to meet those goals. And that kind of sets the stage for you know, pretty interesting dynamics, right? And so if I am decarbonizing both transportation and, you know, the electricity or power sector, um, there's a whole sort of body of interesting research that arises. So we think about uh, one of the big ways of getting to decarbonize transportation is like electrifying, right? And so you are essentially adding in a bunch of new electricity demand, which means that you're you're having to decarbonize both of these things kind of simultaneously. And so in order to like properly think about this landscape, right, on the transportation side of things, uh, particularly with the EVs, which is where I'm kind of focused in, we have to think about all of these questions, right? So how quickly are EVs gonna be adopted? Where will they be adopted? How much will they travel? Um, with charging, like one, what time of the day is someone going to be charging their EV? How fast are they going to charge? Where will they be charging? How often are they charging? Um, can you affect their charging behavior? Right? And so getting a proper understanding of the influence of EVs into the electricity system means that you know, if I'm a power sector researcher, suddenly I have to know all this stuff about transportation. Right? And likewise, if I want to understand like emissions impacts from electric vehicles, suddenly I have to have a good understanding of the, the power system, right? So there's all these questions on, on the other side of the equation as well, right? And so, you know, if I'm thinking about what are the emissions impacts for your traditional gasoline vehicles, it, it's a lot easier to just, okay, look at the tailpipe and be able to kind of understand um, as I'm driving around and burning gasoline, what's coming out of the tailpipe and being able to measure that. Okay, I'm maybe simplifying that a little bit, right? But in this world, now we're talking about what happens when you plug in a car at a certain time in a certain place, uh, what power plants are responding to that charging event to provide that electricity uh, and how do I like quantify the impacts associated with that? Yeah, and so it's tricky thinking about these issues uh, because now you need like this multi-sectoral knowledge and we're getting to this point where a lot of researchers in this area uh, are starting to develop expertise in areas that they normally wouldn't and they're starting to collaborate uh, with different sets of people than they're used to collaborating with. Okay. So one of the things uh, that we wanted to examine here is, okay, in California, uh, so for those who aren't aware, right, there was a couple of years ago, the governor basically said, okay, by 2035, uh, no more gas cars allowed to be sold. Okay, and that has since been sort of instantiated into policy. There's the Advanced Clean Cars 2 regulation, from the California Air Resources Board that basically put out mandatory regulatory targets uh, for automakers selling 
cars in California. So new cars by 2035 basically all have to be zero emission vehicles. Um, on the power sector side, we have uh, these things called renewable portfolio standards, which basically says, you know, for every amount of electricity that you produce, like some amount has to be renewables and that's gonna go all the way up to uh, 100% uh, by, by 2045. Uh, okay, and so if we do these things, can we just like hang up our hats and call it a day, right? We're fully decarbonizing the, these sectors. Um, well, the interesting thing is, as I was mentioning before, there is this kind of interesting dynamic that's happening when we are changing these systems uh, across multiple sectors. And in fact, uh, this may offer unique opportunities, right, for interactions between multiple sectors. Uh, and so uh, I'm gonna highlight that in uh, a couple of these case studies here. Uh, okay, so kind of a quick uh, aside. So this is uh, a diagram of all of the power plants in Cal California and the broader Western interconnect system. Uh, over the last decade or so, I've been uh, developing uh, a grid model to help simulate the operation of these power plants. It's called the grid optimized operation. Oh, it's missing a word. Dispatch model. Uh, otherwise known as the good model. Uh, and it simulates operation uh, and deployment of new uh, capacity. Uh, and this was specifically developed to flexibly be able to handle changes in both the supply of electricity and demand across any number of end use sectors. Obviously, for us, we were really focused on thinking about changes in the transportation sector. Uh, and it can flexibly consider different temporal and spatial resolutions. Uh, it's a big optimization model. Um, I'm not going to get into the details of the math, but I'll describe a little bit qualitatively about what this is doing. Right. So we've got uh, an objective function that is essentially minimizing the cost to produce electricity and build new capacity. Uh, the important one is having generation equal load, right? So when someone turns on a light, light bulb or turns on a TV, it's running a microwave, some power plant somewhere needs to respond to that demand. Uh, so this constraint is essentially fulfilling that. And we have a couple sort of nuanced details in this constraint that allow us to uh, flexibly um, accommodate things like storage and, and EV charging. Uh, and then there's like physical constraints about uh, resource availability for renewables uh, and some, yeah, technical constraints about uh, operation of, of storage. Um, anyways, this framework is essentially what allows us to do this investigation where I can now perturb the electricity load demand in the system and essentially figure out what power plants are responding. Okay, and so kind of a punchline from one of the studies that we've looked at. Uh, so we looked at a whole bunch of different scenarios, uh, policy scenarios. Uh, this was actually at the behest of the state of California to look at uh, broad uh, transportation decarbonization goals. Uh, and essentially what we're finding here, um, let me give you kind of the punchline of this uh, paper. So we've got five scenarios here on the right. Uh, the biggest bar on the left is basically a baseline scenario. If basically you only have gasoline cars and there wasn't a transition to EVs, uh, what happens if you have some kind of fuel efficiency requirements that clean up the greenhouse gases over time? Uh, these are the cumulative emissions. So you see when I introduce more fuel efficient cars, the uh, carbon impacts uh, slightly decrease. Um, and then what if we met the electric vehicle transition goals uh, to get 100% electric vehicle sales by 2035 and then 100% EVs in the total fleet by 2045? You can see there is this really big uh, decrease. 
Uh, and then the red bit is essentially emissions coming from electric vehicles. Okay. Uh, next up is what happens if we do, do both full electrification of transportation system, as well as essentially decarbonizing the electricity grid. You see that red bar decreases even more. Uh, and then the last one is what if you had 100% electric vehicles, 100% renewables um, in 2045, and you also have sort of full smart truck. Yeah. Uh, when you build an electric car? Uh, so, yeah, life cycle emissions. So, this particular study doesn't. Um, this is just for the use phase. Um, but if you were to kind of include that in the carbon accounting, uh, it wouldn't really increase this that much, right? So, you're talking about um, about double the CO2 production emissions for a gas car. And so in the sort of counterfactuals, there's going to be an increase in all of them uh, and, a, and a smaller decrease on the gasoline car side. But um, in terms of the quantity relative to this amount, it would probably be on the order of like, a, let me see, like back of the envelope, like five to 10% increase uh, above these numbers. Yeah. So it would make a difference, but qualitatively, none of the results would, would really change. Okay, so what does that mean uh, from, from a policy perspective? It's like, well, should we be pursuing, uh, should we be pursuing like a primarily fuel efficiency targets? Should we be pursuing, you know, a more aggressive renewables uh, targets? Uh, well, according to this, right, on the transportation side of things, really the biggest drop and cumulative emissions basically comes from electrifying transportation. Okay, so those kind of dominate the climate benefits, at least in California. Uh, yeah, and so those findings, uh, yeah, went to inform some uh, California legislation, um, yeah, reporting for, for how they're meeting some of their climate targets. Any other questions about this particular study? All right. Uh, okay, what about uh, electric trucks? Um, that one was mainly focused on the light duty side of things. Uh, so we have uh, a couple of other studies thinking about these guys in particular. Um, yeah, so heavy duty truck electrification, health benefits. Uh, are, are actually a, a pretty substantial uh, impact as well. So in the previous one, we're mainly looking at greenhouse gases, right? But anytime I'm doing some kind of combustion of fossil fuels, uh, we are additionally getting damages from local air pollution, right? And those can be uh, quantified uh, to health damages, right? So these are sort of monetized health damages from mortality and, and morbidity. So this is some work that we did in collaboration with Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. Using the same sort of power sector model, it is, uh, it, it is combined with a reduced form uh, integrated assessment model that translates the air pollution damages to health damages. Uh, and we can kind of see what that looks like here. So this is um, business as usual. Uh, grid, and then this is like a clean grid. Uh, when you introduce uh, electric vehicle, uh, electric vehicles replacing the heavy duty sector, uh, and you have all types of different damages uh, from different pollutants, so NOx, uh, particulate matter, uh, SO2, and then in total, uh, and you can see kind of the differences um, can be pretty heavily dependent. Uh, on the type of grid that we have, uh, but overall, the net benefits are massive. And one of the really interesting things is, if you think about climate policy that is seeking to reduce greenhouse gases, you know, you can think about, oh, what happens if I enforce like a carbon tax? I get all these, uh, I, I can now monetize 
the like climate damage is. Well, it turns out that uh, if you were to do that, you get these co-benefits, right? Because when I'm blowing up fossil fuels, I'm also getting all this other air pollution. Uh, and if I'm reducing that air pollution, actually the health benefits of those reductions can actually be larger than you know, that monetized value of, of carbon. And so we were finding that that was particularly true in the heavy duty sector. Yeah. Um, so on the H map bottom right, yes. what's happening in the Dakota, Washington, Wyoming area? Yeah. Um, the damages from uh, SO2 are kind of, um, because it's so coal heavy in those regions, are still kind of outweighing the direct benefits um, of reductions. I would say though that like this map is, um, it's slightly deceptive in the sense that like, you also have to think about the population centers as they relate to uh, some of these benefits. So it's kind of hard to visualize the in, in totality. There's just like less people in those areas. Maybe less trucking too. Yes. Although you can kind of see if you look really close, like the main corridors are blue because the local emissions uh, emitted from the truck corridors do go down enough to outweigh you know, the coal plants that are uh, spreading the pollution nearby. Uh, yeah, all right, any other questions? Cool. Um, okay, another interesting sort of application uh, that we were looking at. Uh, oh, and I should mention, you know, this work, um, yeah, before I move on, this work in terms of policy impact, right, we uh, we were able to um, kind of pass this work on to the California Air Resources Board. You know, this was a piece of a broader set of literature that was used in consideration for uh, the advanced clean trucks and advanced clean fleet rules. Uh, and so those those rules are kind of the equivalent of what I was talking about before with light duty uh, getting to 100%. There are actually specific regulations um, that are forcing uh, medium and heavy duty vehicles to fully electrify too. Okay. So uh, even another application. So think about who uses, uh, who might use these vehicles different from like an average driver. Um, yeah, so Uber and Lyft. So we have worked a lot with some of the new mobility companies uh, to think about uh, applications with EVs and think about the specific impact uh, on some of these businesses. Um, so this is uh, a chart that kind of describes the distribution of uh, daily miles being traveled by different types of vehicles. Um, so your average gas car uh, drive something on the order of like 35 to 40 miles a day. Um, and, and those numbers are roughly similar to um, other fuel types like plug-in hybrids and battery electric vehicles on the order of like 30 to 40 miles a day. Um, we got a bunch of data from Uber and Lyft to look at how far uh, their services were um, driving in a particular day. So if you look at just a single service, it's on the order of like 82 miles uh, a day on, on average. Um, and when you combine them, because actually a lot of drivers drive for multiple services, uh, it's getting on the order of 200 miles a day, right? And so several times more than uh, your, your average driver. Okay, and so using a bunch of this data, we analyze the emissions associated with the use of these vehicles uh, and the charging patterns of these vehicles, which was like very different from your typical car. Uh, so uh, to give an example, like if you were driving an electric vehicle, we find that generally you would go to a fast charger, a DC fast like public charger 
about once every two, two and a half weeks or so. These guys are going to use fast chargers on average three to four times a day. Uh, so if you think about this from a policy perspective, if I have like a limited amount of resources to like get people into electric vehicles, um, if you were to switch like the average Californian into an electric vehicle from a gas car, you're going to get some emission savings, right? Um, and if you switch someone who drives for Uber and Lyft into an electric vehicle, those savings are what? are magnified by a factor of three, essentially. Uh, and so these guys are saving on the order of something like 40 kilograms of um, carbon dioxide a day. And so this work uh, actually went directly to support, um, at the time it was called uh, SB 1014, which is uh, legislation that passed and has since become a clean mile standard. And this is a requirement to essentially decarbonize and electrify uh, Uber and Lyft fleets uh, throughout uh, California. Yeah. Uh, so how are they going to be giving grants to people who are drivers or is it Uber and Lyft are being told you have to do it? Or Yeah, basically, yeah, basically Uber and Lyft are uh, forced to electrify their fleets, even though they don't own the cars directly. And so um, there's a whole sort of underlying set of like ways in which they, they're supporting that transition. Uh, so things like providing uh, subsidies to, um, to drivers who are driving electric vehicles. Uh, they also are trying some programs to get customers to pr uh, essentially prefer these vehicles. So um, a lot of these services, you can choose to take a green ride instead of like a uh, regular ride and and that will match you to an electric vehicle. Um, probably the ZEV requirements are just broadly going to help with that transition because it means that everyone is kind of electrifying, um, but they have to do it a little bit faster. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions about that? Yeah, and so, you know, if you recall what I was saying about how frequently they're charging in public, um, they tend to use quite a bit uh, more <laughs> public charging. Um, and so in order to prevent things like congestion for public charters and still to provide access to broader use, uh, user base, uh, we've also been thinking about what the infrastructure requirements are for these vehicles. Um, and so this is a map of uh, the greater Los Angeles region. Uh, and this is showing kind of strategically based off of some modeling on data of where, where Uber and Lyft drivers are essentially providing rides and how far they're going in daily demand kind of all wrapped up into this uh, infrastructure deployment model. We've, we were able to simulate uh, now and sort of out into the future what the electricity demands are going to be from this particular service, from, or from these mobility services, uh, and what the infrastructure requirements uh, are going to be. Uh, and so this went into uh, helping the California Energy Commission. Uh, they have these uh, reports that are meant to support, um, what is it, AB 2077, I think. It's, uh, it's legislation that is giving them authority to essentially support the deployment of charging infrastructure within California. Uh, and so this was a small piece of that, uh, thinking specifically about these TNC Uber and Lyft services. All right. Other things to think about, uh, equity issues, so who benefits from the emissions impacts of, of these things. So imagine that a wealthier individual in San Jose purchases a Tesla, right? Um, and that's a good thing, right? So they may have replaced an older gas car that, that they've been driving around on the road. And you've, you've removed that, you've replaced that with uh, an electric vehicle now, and the emissions uh, associated with that gas car has been kind of taken away. 
great. Um, on the other hand, when I plug in to charge that vehicle, maybe there's like a natural gas plant near Bakersfield that's ramping up, right? And that may conversely reduce the local air quality um, in that area. And so there's this question of, uh, as we undergo this like broader technology transition, you know, you've got things where a lot of people are changing to electric cars. You also have the grid that's cleaning at the same time. You know, who is benefiting from all of this uh, transition? So there are distributive impacts when, when we think about this. So environmental justice has been kind of an increasingly important uh, topic, right? So climate change, you know, we're, we're on board with trying to mitigate that, right? And so now the question is, as you do technology transitions to essentially uh, address these issues, who's going to get left behind? Okay. So in this chart over here, we are able to uh, observe um, again, using that, that grid modeling and integrating with some of the um, integrated, reduced form integrated assessment models from before that I was mentioning, we are actually able to observe areas that are sort of benefiting and areas that actually might get a little bit worse. Uh, and in totality, yes, everything uh, does get better. Like the aggregate benefits are uh, positive. But you'll notice there are like red dots scattered uh, throughout the state. And, and those are actually areas located near uh, like dirtier power generation um, where you may actually experience reduced air quality and therefore, uh, yeah, health damages resulting from this transition. Okay, any questions? All right, moving on. Uh, other topics that uh, we're thinking pretty closely about. Um, so when we think about smart charging, right, what's the, think about the first thing that kind of comes to your mind. A lot of people think about things like renewables integration. Uh, and so, Hopefully some of you guys are familiar with this. This is a chart of net load in California um, over the years. So you can see there's this like dip that happens in the middle of the day. And that is the result of more and more solar getting added to the system, right? And so as more solar gets added, your net load uh, kind of decreases um, and that kind of uh, trough is uh, increasing in magnitude uh, every every year, and that means that slope when your sun starts to go down is getting more and more steep, which means you got to like turn on all these power plants all of a sudden to to meet those uh, demands. And so, yeah, a lot of people think about uh, when we talk about smart charging. This is like, oh, this is one of the big value propositions, right? Is that I can deal with this uh, with this issue because maybe maybe you could have um, people shifting the charging, which will decrease the load uh, shape overall. Uh, with vehicle to grid, you might even inject power and make it so that power plants don't have to uh, turn on um, as extreme in those hours. But actually. Right. In reality, the voided cost of new infrastructure might be an even bigger uh, sort of economic savings than thinking about the benefits of this like renewables integration. Right. And so what I mean here is when you've got a bunch of electric vehicles getting added to the system, right, utilities have to go around and install a bunch of transformers. They have to upgrade their substations. They got to put in new lines, that stuff is actually way more uh, costly than some of that value that we're talking about from like renewables integration. Yeah, and so this requires 
to understand those impacts, this requires a really deep dive into high resolution structure of our distribution system. So these are three of the major investor owned utilities in California, PG&E, I'm sure you guys are all familiar with them, SDG&E and Southern California Edison, which is like the greater Los Angeles region. These are like zoomed in maps to just give you guys a sense of uh, what uh, distribution network kind of looks like. Um, and so each of these lines represents feeder circuits on our distribution uh, infrastructure. And so we were, went around collecting data on all of this infrastructure and then taking information from our models about where we know or expect electric vehicles to be uh, and where they're charging, how fast they're charging, how long they're charging, big effort and identifying the areas where we think this is there's there's going to be a problem right so which feeders are essentially going to overload so this is in 2025 uh and this is in 2045 uh blue means you're okay red means you're in trouble and you got to upgrade and note that this actually does include um planned upgrades by the utility uh, this one. They don't go out this far into the future, so it, maybe it's not a totally fair comparison. But um, what this is showing is that about 80% of the state's distribution system is going to need upgrades. And those costs are estimated to be as high as $20 billion. So if you think about some of the value that uh, vehicle charging integration can have if I can avoid right putting in more of this infrastructure that may actually save uh, ratepayers a, a lot of money, um, right? So I'm I'm sure folks would love it if uh, your rates weren't going up uh, a couple cents every year, which is what we've been experiencing, uh, and so the value of being able to manage the charging. Uh, I think is there's a lot of that here that that kind of remains uh, unexplored. Yeah. How far do Yeah, so generally no more than six years. Yeah. It is, um, I will say, it is particularly problematic in, in the sort of recent past. A lot of the like supply chain behind distribution infrastructure upgrades have been um, kind of slow to respond. And so sometimes if I want to install like an EV charger, I may have to, okay, this is maybe no longer true, but a year or two, two ago, I would have had to wait two years or more for my utility to upgrade the service for me to be able to put in a, a charger. Um, there has since been some movements to um, reduce that burden. And so uh, the federal government put a bunch of uh, money, uh, I believe in the CHIPS Act to help uh, domestic manufacturing a lot, of, a lot of that equipment. So those times are starting to come down, um, but yeah. It, it also speaks to uh, this more fundamental problem of like, if a utility's like foresight in being able to install infrastructure is like limited by this time horizon, that becomes problematic for these like really large scale technology transitions. And so there is actually discussions now with the Public Utilities Commission to like change some of those rules and think about how they can better adapt to like broader uh, evolution of, of, um, of the grid. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, how much of a role does like Kaizo play in, in the upgrade process relative to a utility? Yeah. Um, so it depends on what you're upgrading. So this stuff is all going to be kind of on the, uh, in the purview of the utility um, side of things. But, you know, Kaiso, they're gonna be involved in the sense that they need to, they, they have to know kind of what's happening and anticipate changes in load. So they're gonna be in communication with the utilities on a lot of these kind of uh, projects. 
Uh, Kaiso, more broadly speaking, they're going to be more concerned with uh, capacity changes on like transmission and generation level of things, um, whereas this is this is going to be more utility. Okay. Yes. And so, um, yeah, EVs on the grid remains a very sort of fruitful area of research, right? So they're both undergoing these really massive transformations. Uh, and kind of as I was emphasizing at the beginning here, understanding the dynamics of what's happening in all of this kind of requires expertise in, in both sectors. And, and that is something that's like pretty new for a lot of you know, academics and researchers in this field, right? Like transportation and electricity people didn't really overlap that much in, in the past, but now we're kind of forced to do that. Uh, and, and that's a good thing, right? There's there's a lot to be learned on, on sort of both sides of the, of the aisle. Yeah, big opportunity at the intersection of these two things, right? And so, you, so thinking about transportation and electricity kind of independently and having like expertise in those areas is, is fine, but the synergies of, you know, things like smart charging, vehicle to grid is, is huge. I think that's gonna offer a, a really big economic opportunity for uh, lots of different entities into the future. Um, and so, yeah, don't, don't miss out on that. Uh, okay, and kind of the last thing that I'll say is, uh, yeah, I'd be remiss to like not acknowledge all the many wonderful folks who have helped out um, with various aspects of, of this research, some of which, uh, are, you know, only a small portion of which I'm, I'm highlighting today. Um, but this is uh, a lot of the wonderful students that I've uh, been able to work with uh, over the years and who have contributed uh, a lot to, to this area of knowledge. Uh, so yeah, with that, I wanted to, to end and give some time for discussion and questions, comments.